On this Thursday night, big changes to military misconduct investigations. The military will no longer be able to police and investigate itself. That is a bold and major move. The new defense minister's plan to rebuild trust in the Canadian Armed Forces. Cancer confirmed BC Premier John Horgan's diagnosis and his message to the public. Thwarting cyber threats. We haven't stood up to this. One strategy to fight hackers after that attack on Newfoundland and Labrador's healthcare system. And meanwhile, in Saskatoon, the moose that hoofed it to school. Global National with Donna Friesen. Good evening and thanks for joining us. Just 10 days into her new job and Canada's new defence minister sent a big signal today on how she intends to handle sexual misconduct cases that have festered and gone unpunished in the Canadian forces for years. Anita Onand has agreed allegations, including those against the top brass, should be handled by the civilian system. She's accepted the recommendations of Louise Arbour, a retired Supreme Court justice tasked with coming up with ways to end the persistent problem. Arbour says recurrent allegations of historical sexual misconduct against senior Canadian forces leaders means immediate remedial actions are necessary to start restoring trust in the Canadian Armed Forces. She recommends all allegations should be referred to civilian authorities and charges should be laid in a civilian court. Abigail Beeman breaks down Arbour's recommendations and when they could be implemented in our top story tonight. In issuing her call for immediate change, Louise Arbour said she heard significant skepticism with respect to the independence and competence of the CFNIS and military police, and that has created serious mistrust in the military justice system. And the new Minister of Defence, who tweeted this singular image on day one of the job, flanked by all women at Defence Headquarters, is ready for change. That is a bold and major move that we are making today. She met with Arbor Monday, and Anita Onan says she will work to implement Arbor's interim recommendations immediately. We have to ensure that we're implementing durable and long-lasting reforms. And so what is occurring right now is the consultation between the provost marshal and the director of military prosecutions with their provincial and territorial counterparts. I've been arguing it for the past 20 years, so I couldn't be more pleased. Military lawyer Michel Drapeau calls this a game changer that will see military victims treated equally. If we were looking for one as to how do we get out of this mess, and how do we re-establish control and send a powerful signal to victims, uh, uh, would-be assaulters, and the military justice system is basically to, to do this. What happens with this change is that you remove the serious conflict of interest that is um, in place in the military world. Three days before our Boer sent her letter, Global News reported a senior naval officer witnessed an alleged 2010 assault on Naval Lieutenant Heather McDonald by Admiral Art McDonald and says he told police no charges were laid. I certainly think that the difference between the military prosecutors and uh, civilian prosecutors would have changed the outcome of the case, yes. Onan couldn't say how quickly transfers will happen. There is precedent. The civilian system handled cases like these until 1998. Some military watchers are concerned past problems could be repeated. We need to find out how the Department of National Defense and the relevant uh, law enforcement authorities are going to implement this to avoid the mistakes uh, uh, that we have seen in the 1990s being repeated. Justice Arbour's letter is dated October 20th, addressed to then Minister Harjit Sajjan. Arbour asked for it to be made public. We asked new Minister Anand why it took more than two weeks to do so. She said she learned of the letter after she was sworn in and feels she's moved expeditiously. Donna? All right, Abigail Beeman in Ottawa, thanks. The military is also making changes, it says, will help make the Canadian Armed Forces more safe, welcoming and inclusive. The acting chief of the military personnel says there will be a new dress code to remove separate rules for men and women. The military is also reviewing its rank titles in French, which are all masculine, and it plans to develop a more rigorous process for promoting and selecting leaders within the forces. There's some backlash to the decision by Ontario and Quebec not to make COVID-19 vaccines mandatory for healthcare workers. Both provinces say following through would mean unvaccinated employees would be suspended and the resulting labour shortage would jeopardise the delivery of care. 
That is not how many medical experts see it. Eric Sorensen explains. Hall and Bloorview, a children's hospital in Toronto, implemented a vaccine mandate for its health care workers almost two months ago. Staff vaccines jumped from 86 to 99 percent, and that's made everyone safer. I've got a thousand members of my team here. Every single one uh, feels safer because they know that their colleagues are vaccinated. But the Ontario government decided it will not mandate vaccines for health care workers because it would reduce staffing levels and services at some hospitals. There were some individual hospitals that did indicate to us that they were very concerned about um, uh, loss of uh, health human resources, yes. The government won't say how many hospitals don't want mandatory vaccines. The Ontario Hospital Association says in its survey, 120 out of 140 explicitly support a mandatory regime. It's a question of patient safety and the safety of the hundreds of thousands of people who work in Ontario's hospitals and across the wider health care system. Six provinces require mandatory vaccines for health care workers now or very soon. Four provinces require tests, but not necessarily vaccines for health workers, and those provinces represent 65% of Canada's population. British Columbia put more than 3,000 unvaccinated health workers on unpaid leave, but insists a vaccine requirement is overall better for health outcomes. What we know, that this order is necessary and important and has made our health care system safer for everybody. Hall and Bloorview says two months with a vaccine mandate has unquestionably worked out for the best. At Hall and Bloorview, having a mandatory vaccination policy has not impacted our ability to care for our patients at all. And our view was exactly the opposite, that anything short of full vaccination of our team was more likely to put, uh, to put our patients at risk. One worry is that unvaccinated health workers will shop around for places to work. The Ontario government says it will monitor for any upturn in COVID cases. Harder to measure will be the level of confidence patients and staff have in institutions without a mandate. Eric Sorensen, Global News, Toronto. The UK has become the first country in the world to authorize the use of an antiviral pill to treat COVID-19. Molnupiravir was developed by American drug maker Merck. It's for adults with mild to moderate cases who are at higher risk of complications. It can be taken at home twice a day for five days. A clinical trial showed it reduced by half the risk of hospitalization and death in high-risk COVID patients who were treated early in their infections. The pill is still under review in Canada and the U.S. A new report is shedding light on Canada's enormous health care costs during the pandemic. The data from the Canadian Institute for Health Information says Canada will likely spend more than $300 billion on health care this year. That works out to more than $8,000 per Canadian. The report says it is the single biggest increase in health spending ever in Canada. In 2019, before the pandemic, Canada spent about $267 billion on health care. In Newfoundland and Labrador, pressures of the pandemic are being made worse by a crippling cyber attack on that province's health care system. The attack last Saturday has caused thousands of appointments to be cancelled. And though parts of the system are back online today, the crisis is not over. Ross Lord reports on what happened and why the rest of the country should pay attention. The cyber attack left a health care system that was already overwhelmed with another obstacle to overcome. I'm supposed to have an appointment on Monday, but that won't go ahead now. The attack has disabled Newfoundland and Labrador's health data center, leading to the cancellation of thousands of medical appointments and interrupted critical services like chemotherapy. Ed Power fears his son's ongoing hospital treatments will suffer. Well, I'm a bit worried about the, you know, the kinds of care that he will get under the circumstances, you know. Cybersecurity analysts suspect it's a ransomware attack in which hackers render computer files useless until their victims pay a specified amount of money. I and many other experts across this country have been loudly warning the federal government that every healthcare system across the country was under siege and it ramped up dramatically as the pandemic gained steam. And the federal government has let this issue slip through the cracks. The government's lead agency for IT security suggests there's no surprise. In a statement, the community security establishment said over the last two years, the number of cyber threat actors is rising. The statement said we continue to publish advice and guidance to help organizations be less vulnerable. David Shipley says Canada needs to confront cyber criminals. 
even if it means attacking their computer systems. That's the offense we have to go on. And it's important that we send that message. And we haven't. And I think we've made ourselves a bigger target because we haven't stood up to this. The Newfoundland and Labrador government suggests the worst is over without explaining how. We're listening to world-class experts as we move through this cyber attack uh, speaker. And I can say that progress is being made in our health care system. The government says it's unclear if personal medical information has been stolen and when a crisis that's added insult to injury in health care will be over. Also unclear is which province's health care system will be next to fall victim to this escalating threat. Ross Lord, Global News. BC's Premier is thanking the public for support after announcing he has cancer. John Horgan says a biopsy on a growth in his throat confirmed it was malignant. He says he'll begin radiation treatment in the coming weeks. With me from Victoria is Global's Keith Baldry. Keith, the Premier's being quite forthcoming about the details about his diagnosis. It's not the first time he's had cancer. What more do we know? Yeah, he fought successfully bladder cancer back in 2008, Donna. And again, John Horgan remains very optimistic and upbeat. Put out a short statement today uh, saying, in part, and here's just part of the, the statement from the Premier's office, the pathology confirmed that the growth in my throat was cancerous. My prognosis is good, and I expect to make a full recovery. In the next couple of weeks, I will need to start radiation treatment, which will conclude toward the end of December. He went on to say he intends to continue to chair cabinet meetings. He's going to continue to chair the Council of the Federation which is the group of premiers across the country, and receive briefings on a sort of topic. So it's basically a situation normal as far as he's concerned when it comes to work. He's just not going to be attending in-person cabinet meetings and other meetings. Uh, he'll send Mike Farnworth, the deputy premier, in his place if he needs to, but it's still very much hands-on premier from John Horgan. Okay, and Keith, he chose to go public with the fact he was having a biopsy. You know, he didn't have to tell people that. Why did he decide nope. not to keep it private? Well, he joked at first that he went public because Victoria is a small town and it wouldn't take long for word to get out that the Premier was seen in a hospital. But he also said it was an opportunity to remind people that if you spot something unusual in your, in your health system, your personal health situation, go get treated. Check it out. Don't uh, ignore lumps and such. He felt a lump in his neck. He got it checked out. It took a while, but they finally got the biopsy done and the results coming back. And now he expects to make a full recovery. So it was a message to everyone to, again, go get checked out. Don't ignore the warning signs because early detection works best in situations such as this. All right, Keith Baldry in Victoria, thank you. At COP26 in Glasgow, Canada is committing to stop public funding of overseas fossil fuel projects by the end of next year. Canada and the U.S. are among at least 20 countries that have agreed to end the financing of fossil fuel projects abroad. It's claimed that would divert $22 billion a year to clean energy. Quitting coal, the most polluting fossil fuel, is also a major topic at the climate summit. But in both cases, a few major players are not signing on. Crystal Gamansing has more from Glasgow. Coal is the primary energy supply for Ukraine. Yet the country is one of the newest members of the Powering Past Coal Alliance announced in Glasgow. Several banks also joined the group dedicated to phasing out coal. So has Export Development Canada, the first agency of its kind to get on board. We started with being concerned with the question of how do we put the e an end to coal before coal puts an end to our planet. The burning of coal is the greatest contributor to climate change and transitioning away from coal was seen as the greatest step towards countries achieving the goal of keeping global warming to 1.5 degrees. Major coal users and producers like China, India and the U.S. are not signing on, but they have made other commitments to reduce their reliance on the fossil fuel. The U.S. and China pledged to stop funding coal projects abroad. And at COP26, India's Prime Minister promised to get half of his country's power from renewables by 2030. Advocates say success at COP is not about one announcement or one project. The bigger picture must be kept in view. We need to keep calling these countries to do it fast, but it needs to be managed. And we also need to think about workers and their families. And I do see momentum. I see a momentum uh, when it comes to fossil fuels. I do believe we're getting to a point where we consign coal power to history. 
Every G7 nation has committed to ending international coal financing this year. That's fueled cautious optimism here that the end of coal may be in sight. Crystal Gavanson, Global News, Glasgow. The pleas for peace in Ethiopia. Coming up, the crisis in the African country and what is Prime Minister is urging people to do. Plus new details in a child abduction case in Australia and wild entrance. The moose giving new meaning to crash course. There are growing calls for calm in Ethiopia as that country marks one year since the start of its bloody civil war. A special envoy from the U.S. arrived in the country's capital urging the government to begin peace talks. The conflict began a year ago in the northern Tigray region and has resulted in the deaths of thousands of people and more than a million have been displaced from their homes. Rebels from the north are now reportedly advancing on the capital. The Prime Minister has called on Ethiopians to pick up arms and defend the city. A national state of emergency is in effect. The UN and the president of neighboring Kenya are appealing for an immediate end to the fighting. In Germany, there has been a big spike in COVID-19 cases. The country reported nearly 34,000 new infections today. That is the highest daily number since the start of the pandemic. The German health minister is calling it a massive pandemic of the unvaccinated. About 66% of the population in Germany is fully vaccinated. COVID ICU admissions are also at their highest point since June. An Australian man has been charged with the abduction of a four-year-old girl who vanished from her family's campsite. Police say they found four-year-old Cleo Smith safe and well inside a locked house yesterday. She had disappeared from her family's tent nearly three weeks ago. A 36-year-old man has been charged with various offenses, including forcibly taking a child under 16. Police say they believe he acted alone. The girl is now home with her parents, is said to be adjusting well and getting lots of cuddles. Benefit backfire ahead. Why pandemic aid is now draining the wallets of seniors. You're watching Global National. Many Canadians have been sustained by government support payments during the pandemic. Not only are they key to supporting livelihoods, they also protect the most vulnerable citizens. Among them, low-income seniors. Many were already relying on financial aid before the pandemic hit. And as David Aiken reports, some of them are now finding they've been stripped of the payments they depended on. As she turned 65 last spring, Lou Ann Bannister was thrilled to be able to rent this home in downtown Edmonton. And when I found this place, it was within my budget, and it's turned out to be a fabulous neighborhood. But her budget included receiving her monthly Guaranteed Income Supplement, or GIS, from the federal government. But then, as she moved in during the summer, disaster. I get a notice from the government telling me that my GIS has been uh, depleted. So that was panic city. Bannister is one of tens of thousands of seniors whose GIS was cut off or reduced because the pandemic benefits they received in 2020, like the CERB, pushed them temporarily into a higher income bracket, making them appear as if they were no longer low income seniors. But of course, they still are low income seniors and they count on that GIS check, which could be as much as $950 a month. Without that check, the heat is so low, it's uh, freezing to death. Uh, I have to plan how many trips I make when I'm driving. Groceries are, are now a gourmet meal as craft dinner. It has a devastating effect to force them into extreme poverty, often with no other means or um, avenue of support. Seniors say there was no warning from Ottawa that receiving pandemic benefits might jeopardize GIS payments. Across the board, they're always surprised. They had absolutely no idea. New Democrats plan to make this issue a top priority in Parliament. We're going to keep pushing until the government recognizes that what it's doing to our most vulnerable seniors right now uh, is simply unacceptable and that they need to change course. And if there is no change of course... It's to the point where I just don't know how I'm going to survive. 
The new Minister of Seniors, Kamal Carroll, was not available for an interview, but her office said in a statement that seniors who have had their GIS taken away can apply to have some of it reinstated for limited circumstances, and those requests will be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. David Aiken, Global News, Ottawa. Up next, a spectacular display of nature's greatest light show. Talk about a crash course. This moose smashed its way into a classroom in Saskatoon. It had been spotted wandering outside and then ran through a plate glass window of an elementary school. One student was hurt but didn't need medical attention, and neither did the moose. It was tranquilized by conservation officers and released outside the city. And nature treated parts of the country to one of the most intense displays of northern lights in years. Auroras danced across the skies in an astonishing multitude of colors and were captured by photographers in a number of places. A U.S. satellite also took some out-of-this-world shots of the northern lights streaking over North America. The intensity was caused by a solar flare which sent blasts of plasma from the sun unleashing a major geomagnetic storm. Just stunning. And that is Global National for this Thursday. I'm Donna Friesen. We leave you tonight with the Festival of Lights. Millions of people are celebrating Diwali, signifying peace and joy and marking the victory of light over darkness. It's celebrated all over the world by various religions and cultures, especially in South Asia. Tonight, we leave you with celebrations in Surrey, British Columbia. Thanks for watching. Robin Gill will be at the Anchor Desk tomorrow, and I will see you on Saturday for the new reality. Take care of yourselves. Bye-bye.